OK, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, I know we had several more uh, registrations for the event. So um, we'll just let everybody uh, join in as they are able to. And uh, we are also recording the, um, the webinar. So we'll post that um, after we have a chance to take a look at the recording and, and make sure it's uh, good quality. And then uh, we'll post it on the SimSec website. So uh, good evening, everyone, uh, if you are in the uh, East Coast time zone, or uh, if you are not, uh, hello and welcome to CIFAR, it's uh, SimSex Forum for authors and readers, where we get together with uh, some of our most popular authors for the year and uh, allow them to uh, discuss the articles that they uh, published uh, on SimSec. Uh, we open up the uh, the voting for CIFAR to our members and uh, the uh, articles chosen uh, were um, uh, written by the panelists that you see here today. So we've got a great lineup. Uh, I will uh, just briefly introduce everybody and, uh, and then um, I'm going to hand it over to our first uh, speaker. So uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Tabitha Mallory and Dr. Ian Rauby discussing their article, Evolution of the Fleet, A Closer Look at the Chinese Fishing Vessels Off the Galapagos by uh, uh, Bill Bray, uh, who wrote uh, Winning the War on Distraction, Military Leaders Need Quiet Minds in the Digital Age. Ryan Martinson, No Ordinary Boats, Cracking the Code on China's Spratly Maritime Militias. And Frank Gortner, the Navy should stop talking about the future and start building it. And we we may also hear from uh, Steve Wills at CNA uh, dis to discuss his uh, new book on strategy. And uh, hopefully he'll have a chance to join us. So uh, I won't steal um, anyone's thunder. I'm going to hand it over to um, Ian Rauby to discuss uh, his article. I will say this was the most read article on our website for the year. Uh, so very popular uh, topic and well done to uh, to you and Tabitha. Uh, lots of interest from our, our members and readers and I look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Ian. Thanks very much, Jimmy. And thanks to all who uh, who, who made that uh, the most read article. Um, I think we were both uh, somewhat overwhelmed by the response and, and we really appreciate not only the, um, the the readership, but the feedback we've we've gotten um, and the encouragement uh, to go further in this space. Um, I think one of the one of the things that is worth highlighting is the genesis of that article. Um, we uh, we have known each other for a number of years. We uh, talked about doing something together, <clears throat> and um, when I started seeing the stories about this this emerging Chinese fleet that, that kind of appeared out of nowhere, uh, as the news stories would have you uh, understand it, um, I, I started scratching my head. Um, this notion that a fleet just suddenly uh, came out of thin air off the Galapagos was, was a joke. Um, those of us who have worked uh, in the space and who have worked with Ecuador in particular have uh, years of experience looking at and dealing with the, the, the Chinese fleet uh, off of the coast there. and. I thought it was worth uh, talking to Tabitha about. So we, we began the conversation. She'd already gotten some uh, requests and, and uh, in inquests about it as well. Uh, and so we decided to, to really take a closer look. And what we ended up doing is leveraging uh, the WinWord platform, as well as our own expertise and Tabitha's access to uh, Chinese sources uh, to take a closer look at what was really going on. And I think what came out of it are, are really three things. Number one, um, the importance and the need for evidence-based and data-based analysis. Um, number two, the need for rigor in that analysis. And number three, the need for caution. So let me go through each of those very quickly because um, I think they point to uh, work that needs to be done around the world right now, uh, looking at uh, both uh, IUU fishing and distant water fleets and, and not just the Chinese. Um, and so I want to make it very clear that, that we were leveraging knowledge and expertise about this Chinese fleet, but we were not trying to be ideological in any way and come to any conclusions. Um, and so what we were trying to do was look at the evidence and look at the data and see what it actually said. And what the evidence showed was that for the last five years prior to 2020, there had been a growing number of Chinese vessels fishing in and around uh, the Galapagos uh, Marine Protected Area and uh, Galapagos EEZ. 
Over the last couple of years, since the arrest of the Fu Yuan Fu Yuan Yuleng 999 in uh, 2017, uh, the amount of activity inside the exclusive economic zone had decreased to, to nil. Uh, but what was striking was just the sheer volume of vessels and activity immediately outside the exclusive economic zone. Um, and that remains true uh, through this summer as well. However, um, Tabitha can talk a little bit more about some of the, the ongoing trends. But what we looked at was, okay, so here are all these vessels. Who are they? What do they actually mean? What are they actually doing? And what we were able to determine was that there are a lot of interesting and, and somewhat confusing uh, activities occurring uh, based on the AIS signatures of the vessels, including uh, a significant amount of dark activity, a significant amount of uh, sharing of identities, both IMO numbers, MMSI numbers, and in some cases, even names. So we actually found two vessels uh, sharing the same name, but different flags, uh, one Chinese, one British. We saw a lot of activity inter interacting with not only tankers for bunkering operations, uh, but reefers for transshipment for onward uh, journey of, of fish to, to China. Um, and so we started looking at all this data and some of it just came out as puzzling. For example, uh, some vessels reported constant length changes, changes in, in uh, draft that made no sense. Um, and what we, what we noticed was that there are all these signatures happening, but we can't really conclusively say what is what. And so this brings me from the evidence point to the, the rigor point. Uh, which is that we cannot be overly conclusive in looking at this and saying we know what's happening. Um, and so for that, we need eyes on the water uh, and we need a, a greater look. And, and thankfully, um, we've, we've started seeing that occur now. Uh, there was just a, a major expose um, by, by Sea Shepherd and the AP uh, looking at, at the actual vessels on the water. But uh, I'm a lawyer by background, and one of the things that I find extremely frustrating in talking about the IUU fishing space, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing space, is that first of all, there's almost no distinction uh, made between illegal, unreported, and unregulated. Um, that needs to change. Uh, but more importantly, I think we need to stop using IUU fishing as a catch-all term for things that we just either don't like or, or, or find to be somewhat concerning. Um, IUU fishing is a phenomenon, um, but it has grown into uh, more of an emotional movement than it is actually a, a legal or, or identifiable set of activities. And so we need to de-emotionalize de uh, the, the discussion around IUU fishing and focus much more on uh, what is actually happening, who's doing it, and who is behind it. And to that, we worked really hard on identifying not just what the vessels were doing and, and what, what activity might have been associated, but who they were tied to. And we went into the ownership structures and, and, and sought to map that out. And that all painted a picture um, that Tabitha can speak to more about Chinese policy and, and how this ties into uh, the Chinese strategy. And that final point about strategy is where I come to my third point, which is the need for caution. Um, I don't know if, uh, but it is certainly possible, uh, our article has actually helped China in executing its strategy because what we have done is highlight and document the presence of that fleet over time. And one of the things that, that China has uh, articulated as one of its, its sort of fundamental uh, strategic principles is the notion that, quote, occupying brings about rights and interests. And if we look at their strategy and their approach towards the South China Sea and the attempts to essentially claim uh, excessive maritime territories throughout uh, that region, um, they have grounded a lot of their arguments in the notion of traditional fishing grounds. I've seen this physically uh, in Natuna, in the, uh, in the South China Sea, in the Natuna Sea, off the northernmost uh, part of Indonesia, um, and they are very aggressive in trying to make the case that they have traditional fishing grounds. As the world moves towards uh, regulation of the high seas beyond national jurisdiction, um, I think China is hedging and working to make sure that they have a presence and activity uh, that confers them traditional fishing rights in the high seas areas that are otherwise at the moment uh, unregulated. Um, and as we see RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, beginning to uh, implement uh, new types of regulation, uh, that is going to become a, a feature of the arguments for what states should have some rights. Um, and so this notion of occupying brings about rights and interests uh, is an area where we should we should have some caution and we should pay attention. Um, so those are uh, the three points I wanted to make, and I'll turn it over to Tabitha to uh, to get a little bit more specific. Tabitha?
Thanks, Ian. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I also want to thank SIMSEC and CNA for hosting this event tonight. And thanks to the audience for voting for the article that Ian and I wrote last year. Uh, so it's, it's an honor to be here. I thought what I would do is just provide all of you with some updates uh, on our article, which was published about a year ago, almost exactly, uh, and talk about uh, just some of the new developments. So uh, the first the first one is that I actually had the opportunity recently to speak with the head of the Ecuadorian Navy, who took me aside and showed me on his phone some of the maps that he had that demonstrated that the Chinese fleet this year is fishing much farther away from the Galapagos. And I think it's challenging to say definitively that this is because of the attention that the fleet received last year. It could just be because of natural variations. Maybe the fishermen are seeking better fishing grounds elsewhere this year. Um, but I do think that there is some basis to say that the attention on these issues really does matter. Um, and things like sharing information, technology, you know, the media playing a big role in drawing attention to this. You know, China really does care about its reputation. And so um, bringing attention to this, I think, is moving things in a positive direction. So then a couple other developments. So in the article, we talked about the financing of China's distant water fishing operations, which is a really important part of making this activity possible. And since then, I've done a little bit more work looking at the fishing subsidy that China's providing. Um, actually, Oce the organization Oceana just put out a two-pager about this yesterday, if anybody's interested. Um, and so some of the, I just kind of thought I'd talk about some of the main takeaways, because I think it's relevant to this, um, uh, this issue. And one is that the domestic subsidies for China have decreased over time, um, with the exception of the maritime militia, which Ryan will be talking about later. Uh, so they've decreased for domestic subsidies overall, but uh, this is not for this is not true for the distant water fishing fleet. The subsidies there have, at the very least, stayed the same. And so, even though the distant water fishing industry accounts for only 22% of China's overall capture fisheries, it accounts for 49% of their subsidies. And then of the subsidies going to the distant water fishing industry, 58% of those are going to the high seas part of the industry as opposed to the uh, fleet that's operating the EZs of other countries. Um, and that's a conservative estimate. We made that uh, based on just the vessel number, but the high seas vessels are actually in many cases twice the size of the vessels that are fishing in the EZ. So it could be higher than 58%, but I think it you know, it just really shows um, some of, some more evidence uh, of some of the trends towards focusing on uh, fishing on the high seas that Ian and I talked about in that article. Uh, another interesting trend is that it seems like the Chinese government is shifting money away from the fuel subsidies, uh, but is shifting that money, a considerable amount of money towards the construction of distant water fishing bases, both in China and abroad. And this, I think, is also some pretty, you know, uh, hard evidence uh, that is um, kind of showing that China's plan that it laid out in its uh, 13th five-year plan for fisheries development uh, to consolidate the industry, the distant water fishing industry, from the point of harvest uh, to the end market uh, and, and increasingly in China. And so they're providing the infrastructure to do that. Um, and it brings up some interesting questions too about you know, the future the future role that these bases, especially abroad, could play. Like, is there a possibility for you know, a dual purpose for these? Um, and then finally, the uh, another finding from the research was that in addition to the direct subsidies that the Chinese government is providing to the industry, the policy bank, um, things like loans uh, to the industry, um, from the three major policy banks that China has, uh, as well as tax exemptions on catch brought back to China, for example, income tax. Um, this also provides a large share of support to China's distant water fishing industry. And if you're looking at the WTO negotiations that are going on right now on fishing subsidies, the indirect subsidies like these are not as much of a focus um, as the direct subsidies are. So I think it warrants some further look at uh, other sources of support. Uh, and so I'll just end by kind of echoing something that Ian said, which is that, you know, in this article, we try to be balanced. And I, I think, you know, he said it really well that it's not just China that 
is engaging in these kinds of activities and you know other countries around the world have had many more years um, to fish unsustainably and so you know we do have to, to to continue to work with china in the future so it doesn't really help to just kind of point a finger at them and label them the bad guy we do have to still figure out ways to approach this issue constructively um, and so we all have a role to play as the international community uh, and especially personally if you eat seafood um, it's important to to think about all of this so i'll end there and thanks again very much all right thank you tabitha and thank you ian uh, both uh, for that presentation on your article. It's uh, it's really fascinating. I've been following the topic in general uh, for some time, but uh, the insight from your article and the, uh, and the detail uh, was enlightening. And um, I, I appreciate you expounding on, on the article. Um, I, I, many of your comments uh, brought up a question in my mind and specifically to the point that it's not just China uh, as, as you ended with Tabitha. Um, I'm curious to know what you think of the role of UNCLOS and the future of UNCLOS, um, and maybe more broadly, uh, what can we do, uh, we being the United States, but also our, our uh, partner nations and the international community, um, because it's not just China, and we, we may be culprits ourselves, or our, our allies may be, uh, so it gets to be more of a sustainability and, and uh, ecological question. Um, than, than just purely a, a quote unquote great power competition issue. So uh, I'm curious your thoughts there. And Jimmy, if you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll tag my question on um, to yours because I think it's along the same vein. Um, Ian in particular, I'd be interested to hear um, what you think the uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction agreement that's under negotiation at the moment uh, will do um, with respect to Chinese distant water fishing activity on the high seas, um, and whether there are measures that um, could be included in that treaty that would uh, help constrain some of the, the most pernicious elements or effects of, of Chinese distant water fishing activity. Tabitha, do you wanna go first? Uh, and then I'll, I'll come back with a, a longer answer. Well, what, no, why don't you go first and I'll, because you kind of know the landscape of the UNCLOS right. a little better. All right. I, I think, I think, first of all, um, you know, I, I don't think we need to uh, revisit or renegotiate UNCLOS. We need to actually uh, get to the point of being able to, uh, to, to manage the, the sovereign rights that are, that are granted under UNCLOS. Um, I think worldwide, one of the problems is that we, um, we have a great imbalance in, in domestic capacity uh, from uh, Coast Guards and navies around the world actually able to even enter the EZ, much less patrol it effectively. Um, and in many cases, forget patrolling. We don't even have uh, MDA platforms that, that give uh, the maritime operation centers of a lot of states who have a lot of the world's exclusive economic zones visibility as to what's happening. And so um, we need to first understand what is happening in the areas that we can control before we try to control areas beyond national jurisdiction. Having said that, the, the point of, of potential rights conferred uh, by, by presence in the high seas is something that we need to be thinking about because um, it, 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 we run a risk um, of allowing for the fishing space to change the understandings of both uh, sovereignty and freedom of navigation that are, are so fundamental to the international system of the sea. And so we are seeing states already using the fishing space as a means of essentially pushing their law enforcement capacity beyond 12 nautical miles. Um, and we have to, to push back against uh, that sort of mission creep. Um, and so on the one hand, we need to keep these two distinguished. On the other hand, uh, there needs to be a closer, uh, a closer look at how to work together between the folks that are focused on sustainability and those who are focused on law enforcement. Because right now, that is the most exploitable gap for criminal activity and nefarious state action anywhere in the world. Um, that is a, a blind spot that a lot of navies and coast guards and fisheries uh, departments have, because those who look at fishing as a sustainable matter uh, aren't interested in, in drug trafficking, human smuggling, um, arms trafficking by fishing boats, because that doesn't impact sustainability. The folks that are focused on law enforcement aren't interested in, uh, or are often dissuaded from even looking at fishing vessels, because that's the purview of the fisheries 
department or ministry and the whole economics behind that never get touched. And so that is a, a, a major gap. And so if we were going to look at, at what uh, concerns we would have within BBNJ and within uh, this wider approach to, to starting to regulate the, uh, the, the high seas in some way, we need to be mindful that the, there are a lot of people who are capitalizing already on some of these uh, law enforcement versus sustainability concerns. Um, and make sure that we are not baking in opportunities for all kinds of nefarious activity to, to get the better of us more at the domestic front. In terms of BBNJ, I also feel that we are, I, I, there, there's, I, I published an article um, with, with a number of academics a, a year and a half ago, um, looking at it as, as a phenomenon of wealth blindness. And we are, we are very much the blind leading the blind on the BBNJ uh, front. We do not know what the economic opportunities are for the subsea life, minerals, et cetera, beyond uh, national jurisdiction. Um, it's just far beyond our, our current competence. And so to come up with a regulatory scheme that is overly uh, constraining uh, may end up backfiring, uh, and it may actually end up providing opportunities for states that, that are, are already taking this sort of occupational-based uh, or occupying-based uh, approach to, to have a massive windfall. And so we need to be very, very careful how we negotiate this. In fact, uh, the last point I'll make, this was the original concern uh, why the United States did not uh, ratify UNCLOS. Uh, we were concerned about uh, the, the subsea rights that were being essentially allocated to uh, the, the um, International Seabed Authority and uh, the uncertainty as to how mineral rights beyond national jurisdiction might end up being uh, allocated to the point that a U.S. company could potentially uh, extract uh, minerals and have to pay a, a hostile enemy state uh, part of the proceeds out of that um, because of the way um, the, the control was was rested. So I think we need to, uh, to to take a pause and regulate what we can, do what we can, um, and and uh, be cautious as to what implications. Uh, each of our actions make at this point, because th there's a long road ahead before we are actually able to to govern this space effectively. So I'll add a little bit to that based on kind of the, the fisheries angle here. Um, so coming out of the UNCLOS framework was the fish stocks agreement, which calls on countries to form regional fisheries management organizations to manage stocks that are on the high seas and then straddle areas uh, from the high seas across you know, more than one EZ and so on. And so one of the challenges with that system is that you end up having a patchwork of RFMOs around the world that cover certain areas of the world, but not others, um, and also certain stocks, but not others. And so it's, it's um, not that difficult for countries to kind of uh, exploit some of the uncovered areas. And so we've seen China do this, for example. Um, it's done this with the tuna RFMOs. Um, so, you know, for a while, China was really targeting albacore tuna because that was not included in the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, for example. And then we saw that also with the South Pacific RFMO because they have only started covering squid um, as of just earlier this year. And squid, which is a, a you know, largely high sea stock, um, and there's also a number of, of different uh, commercial squid species um, that uh, squid is not really largely covered around the world. There's really just that one RFMO that covers it so far. And then within the RFMOs themselves, there are some challenges like um, the consensus system they have for decision making, which means that you essentially have like the lowest common denominator for, you know, countries can vote down something that goes against their interests um, in terms of like their, you know, their, their fishing targets. Uh, and then, so in terms of the um, BBNJ, so there are some implications for fisheries, um, but a lot of the focus, like so trawling, for example, you know, um, is really destructive to the to the seabed. Uh, but a lot of the focus has been on seabed mining, and um, kind of one of the things that I kind of just want to add to what Ian said is that. You know, it's not so, I, I would say it's not so much the countries that are um, a problem here. I mean, China does have the highest number of exploratory uh, contracts for um, seabed mining, uh, but, you know, it's really the vested interests of the companies that I think we need to watch out for, because what you have is, you know, because it's such a high tech industry, the people who have knowledge about seabed mining um, are the ones that are actually working for these companies. 
And so it's, you know, it's um, kind of, you know, getting an unbiased approach to managing those, those resources. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're not, um, you know, just relying on the expertise of people who have vested interest in, in accessing those resources. Uh, and so, you know, another issue too is, um, uh, and I'm quoting from an article I read a while ago, but uh, so it might be a little different now, but if you look at um, the, the ISA scientific committee, I mean, they're, they're, they're only made up of like 24 people or something, uh, something around that. Uh, and you're thinking, you know, you think about that, it's just that kind of handful of people that are deciding on a lot of these resources for the rest of the world. Um, so I think there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into, you know, how to best manage that. And it's, re it's really important because, um, you know, some of the scientific evidence shows that, you know, if we don't get that right, I mean, you know, they've done experiments disturbing this, the deep seabed like 30 years ago, and it still hasn't recovered. And so we could lose a lot of benefit from that biodiversity um, for, you know, humankind, such as marine pharmaceuticals, like antivirals, you know, that we haven't discovered. Um, so yeah, so in there. Well, thank you both. That is, uh, that's great. And you know, it's, uh, we, we tend to focus on the illegal aspect of IUU fishing, but it sounds like there are plenty of opportunities, legal opportunities uh, within the uh, regulatory patchwork that you described. So um, lots of work to do, I think, for the international community, and hopefully we can continue down that path. Uh, so I'd like to, to transition now to uh, Bill Bray and uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Bill is a retired Navy captain, uh, currently deputy editor in chief at uh, Proceedings, the Naval Institute's Proceedings, and he's been one of our more bold authors for uh, SimSec, uh, tackling subjects that uh, are difficult and um, garnering a lot of attention and um, really good in, at ter in terms of getting the discussion started. Uh, but in particular, the article that uh, readers nominated uh, was called Winning the War on Distraction, Military Leaders Need Quiet Minds in the Digital Age. So with that, I will hand it over to Bill. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, Dimitri, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, SimSec and CNA, for hosting this. Um, so I'll just really quickly summarize what I wrote. Um, it started in about the mid-2000s. I was deployed to East Africa, and lived in a unconnected shack essentially no internet connection no cable tv so to have that experience today you either probably have to be incarcerated in prison or uh, be captured as a pow it's almost hard to imagine anywhere on the planet where you where you would not be connected and i uh, in my free time i like to read and i i found myself having a hard time in the first few weeks concentrating on a page or two at a time uh, without expecting something to happen, an email to pop in the queue or something. And it, it was very frustrating, and I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing. Um, and that led me down a path to start thinking about uh, why this is. And uh, so over the years, I got interested in reading about this, um, and that culminated in, in, in this article, or at least at this point. So <clears throat> it is a real problem. Um, Back in the early 2000s, um, Stanford University, Clifford Nash, who's uh, passed away, ran a, a series of cognitive studies on, on students. And uh, the conclusion was that multitasking is actually not a real thing. It's very bad. Human brains are bad at it. People do a lot of things lousy when they multitask. They don't do anything well. Um, uh, contrary to the kind of the pop wisdom at the time, which is you can do this. Um, and then, um, uh, and then along came the smartphone, which just upped the game for distraction to, to another level. Um, uh, and, and we know, and, and I think anybody who's been following along that now the, uh, sort of the, the, the tide has turned a little bit on, on the value of, of being connected like that and the value of, of certainly of social media. There's a lot of mental health issues. Um, and, and that is true, <clears throat> but in my particular uh, focus was cognitive health, the ability to concentrate. And you can imagine uh, many things in the military, watch standing wise and others, where concentration is, is a mission readiness issue. Um, so 
when I started working on this, I reached out to several Navy uh, psychologists and said, are you, what are you doing about this? Uh, you know, the, the, the research is out there um, and it's pretty good, becoming pretty clear that uh, constant distraction is a cognitive health issue that, uh, that impacts people's ability to focus. And, and uh, you know, and I got no positive or even most of them didn't want to engage on like it wasn't a thing, you know? And so I, um, I've been thinking that, you know, when the Navy in my service, the Navy or the military in general feels like there's a health issue affecting the force, they tend to do something about it. You know, they tend to put better food on the mess decks. They tend to implement the, uh, the physical fitness test. Uh, they do things. They they make sailors do preventive uh, me medicine. Go get a PHA every year. Make sure their vital signs are. You know there are things that you do to make sure the force is healthy, and they aren't doing anything about this. Um, not at least when I wrote this, and really not as much. Although we published a few things, and it's starting to I think get a little bit of juice. You know, a little bit of force um, out there. Um, so that's uh you know that's that's really why i wrote this because i think it's a health issue clearly for military people but anybody i mean on the outside and i think that that we have to take it seriously and start thinking about what to do about it um we're not going to unplug from the world uh people aren't going to be prohibited from having phones uh they they're going to you know still have these things so there's a kind of a two part of it to me. There's a, it's a leadership issue. So leaders need to lead and show that they take this seriously and they, they talk about it when they're in front of their people. Um, they set the good example. Um, they, uh, and that's part. And then the other part is, is a health issue. You can actually give cognitive, you know, uh, attention tests to very briefly to people when they go in for their PHA and depending on what MOS they're in, what rating, what their specialty is, you could probably come up with some, I'm speaking out of my field for sure, medical field, but you could probably come up with some sort of standards for different kind of uh, positions, occupations, um, and, and, and start doing that. And if they don't pass it, just like not passing the, 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 the 1.5 mile run, um, there needs to be some remedial action to do that. The, the beauty of the brain is, when I, you know, I read about uh, this is it, it, it's easily distractible and you get into this situation where you can't focus, you can't filter out irre irrelevancy. Um, and you know, not only does it affect your ability to do a task or focus on something, but it affects your um, uh, mood and it makes people uh, kind of anxious and uh, they get attention deficit disorder, but the brain's a beautiful thing because it's it's very elastic and it will correct itself if it's put in the right place. And so, if you start doing these things as, as these mindfulness drills and be more disciplined with your interaction with social media and just any sort of media in general, um, you can improve your ability to concentrate. It's not easy in this world for young people, but any people. I mean, my generation my mother's generation, everybody's susceptible to this. Um, so that's, uh, and many people have, you know, writing on this, Cal Newport at Georgetown writes on it a lot, if you're familiar with him. Uh, Arthur Brooks just wrote in the Atlantic about how to break your phone addiction and some ide you know, ideas on how to do that um, without getting rid of your phone. Like the idea that we're gonna not have smartphones, you know, is, is just not true. People do banking on smartphones. They do all kinds of practical things that they need, and it's becoming impossible to think of a world where you don't have it. So just like when we started driving automobiles 100 plus years ago, and there was a lot of, you know, lack of knowledge on safety, like what happens when a car hits another car at 40 miles an hour? People weren't doing those kind of tests in the early automotive age. There were no seatbelts. There was, so we need seatbelts for the brain is, is what we need to do. And the military needs to start getting very serious about it. And leaders need to stop implying that if you're not constantly connected, you're doing something wrong. And I think that was another big part of it. I mean, it started with the pager way back when, and then the Blackberry showed up and you saw everybody walking around, constantly talking on this. And, and it, it was 
sort of this imp- impression leaders gave was if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. And so there wasn't this focus on mindfulness. So that's the gist of it. I don't want to take up any more time. I'm happy to answer any questions, Jimmy. All right. Thank you, Bill. That's, that's really great. I, uh, I, I, I agree um, with uh, everything that you wrote. And uh, I, I struggle with it, uh, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, you know, I, 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 w- I note that it is um, certainly social media has an impact and our ability to access everything via the smartphone. Um, of course, TV and everything else. Um, but it, uh, it even goes into uh, inside the military with the, the data feeds that we have that are uh, proprietary, you know, from our professional uh, whether it's uh, intelligence or message traffic. Uh, and, and as you pointed out, you know, just being connected, um, it, it, there was a premium put on it for so many years. And uh, I think there is a sort of a, a shift, uh, a cultural shift happening, hopefully. Um, I'm curious, because you kind of alluded to it that it's important, uh, it's a leadership issue, you said that. And, and you know, what would you say to, um, you know, senior leaders that, uh, that may be interested in trying to emulate the the behavior so that it could be uh, uh, replicated all throughout the organization. Um, if they if we are to implement or continue this cultural shift um, to a less distracted mindset and maybe even less connected, more mindful. Um, I'm curious, you know, what what would you tell a, a senior leader? How can they uh, be a good example? Yeah, well. First of all, they should talk about it and and do it. And, and another thing, and I I, I noticed this at the, I think it's um, Huffington um, the company. They 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 put a, a something in place that when somebody goes on vacation, you cannot email them. If you email them, the email comes back. And so I think senior leaders, one thing they should do is say, look, I'm not going to email you at 10 o'clock at night and expect you to answer me. I'm not going to email you after hours. I mean, this may, there are exceptions if, if you're the Admiral's EA or certain, there are certain jobs, but most people feel that they need to check things all the time, right? When they're waking, like they don't go very far, you know, a few minutes, you know, what they, I got to check when maybe I got something, maybe I got an email from my boss, maybe I got this, maybe I got that. And so it, from a leadership standpoint, to tell people, I'm not, I do not expect you to answer me. Um, I may send an email at night because that's when I'm working. I don't care if you if you if you email me the next day. I don't expect you to answer. I just want you to know if I really need you, I'll call you um, or something like that. I mean, these are like little tools leaders can take to say, go home, quiet your mind, you know, do some deep reading. I want you. I want you to have a, a strong you know mind when the when the moments really count and you're doing things for me. I mean, th- there are things that you can do. Uh, when you're running a, a, a division, a department, a, a ship, a, a unit that that can help people, you know, make enable them to disconnect when they're not in the in the work environment. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, pause to see if anybody else has any questions, and then uh, we'll get ready for our next speaker. Okay, this is Frank. I'll I'll ask a question if I could. Um, I, it it is an interesting. Uh, it's a great topic and it's an interesting article. So thanks for writing it, Bill. And I think, um, you know, one thing I'd be curious about is if, if in uh, any of your research or if you've thought to you know look at best practices, you know, outside the Navy and in sort of corporate America. I know, for example, um, you know, I have a number of friends who work for. For Amazon, and they actually require them to turn in their work phone when they go on leave. Uh, of course, they're, they're they're basically plugged in for you know 24 hours when they're they're running hard, right? But then they actually have to turn in their their Amazon corporate phone uh, when they leave. So I think this is a a, a challenge that um, you know extends well beyond the Navy um, right now. And I'm just wondering if uh, you know first off, if if you know if you know of any efforts to kind of to branch out and, and look at what 
what other enterprises, large enterprises, are doing that that you know also requires sort of global operations and and support. Um, but then second, if um, if you think that there's is there anyone in the Navy that you're aware of? I know the Marine Corps are doing it sort of organizationally, um, you know, from the Commandant's office down. But do you, do you know of anyone in the Navy that's actually looking at it organizationally? Because I, I worry about these things sometimes, you know, when we put the onus on the commanders, but the commanders are not really, um, you know, uh, you know, experienced in, in doing this kind of uh, attention management, nor are they really able to standardize um, the practices across the fleet, you know, who, wh where does this reside in the Navy to start to, to start to address this? Yeah, well, I'll start with the second part first. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know any, you know, I've, I've been retired five years. I'm not as uh, plugged in. I had an opportunity yesterday, or not yesterday, um, a few days ago, I was playing golf with the Surgeon General of the Navy. I should have asked him. He would have been a great guy to ask himself. But we were talking about vaccine mandates on the course most of the time and not, uh, <laughs> and not the uh, cognitive health. Um, so, uh, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, as far as best practices outside, yes, there are, like you mentioned, Amazon, I didn't know that, um, Huffington, and there are other companies that are starting to take this uh, more seriously. I think obviously the military should do that as well. Um, the article, most recent article I read was um, by Arthur Brooks, who said, hey, you know, you ha it, and this requires an, an enormous amount of self-discipline, which is the, you know, the, the greatest challenge. It's mostly, um, it's like quitting smoking. I mean, you can't like, you know, it's difficult to have to impose some sort of solution on this problem besides making people aware of it and testing them for it and, and, and whatnot and make, make having some consequences for not being able to concentrate. Um, that will get their attention. Uh, but Brooks's main point is you should only scroll on your phone, you know, designate two 20 minute blocks a day. And, and that's when you scroll. And, and then, you know, he leaves this phone by the door when he comes home, he doesn't go, you know, over to it. Uh, other people do that. Um, so there's, uh, that's kind of a personal wellness, you know, things. Again, it's so much harder to do than to say to do. Everybody knows that. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to hear from my kids. My, my kids are grown and live in different parts of the country. You know, what if they text me? I wanted to answer them, you know, so there, it is not a simple thing to do. And maybe you let people know that. Um, but institutionally, you know, in the Navy, one of the things is, you know, Navy, at least, you know, part of the Navy at any time is going to sea. That probably helps a little bit. Um, and uh, if you live in a skiff, you know, that's, that's a good way. And you can't bring your phone in and there's, there's a few less distractions. But really, it's got to be, um, um, you know, I like the idea of, uh, you know, don't take, don't take your work home with you. Don't take your work phone home uh, unless you absolutely have to. You're some critical job that you need to be called in. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I just, I'd like to see the Navy stand up and say, yeah, we got to do something about this. I will say I'm teaching an ethics course at the Academy in addition to my day job now and um so it's a good opportunity to kind of engage with young people and, and see um kind of how they think about these things uh one of the drills we have them do in this course is a social media fast now it was originally put in place to um just teach them about uh stoicism and and giving something up and and you know and it's certainly good for that but i'm also bringing in sort of the cognitive health angle of it too and uh, we'll see how they how they respond to it. All right, thank you, uh, Ian. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to to jump in on that that last point there um, about the uh, you know not contacting people while they're they're away and um, unless they have a really critical job. I think one of the things that strikes me is that particularly younger people, um, there is a a clamor or a need to have. Uh, sort of inflated self-importance, <laughs> um, you know, everybody has to be essential, everybody has to be critical, everybody has to be unreplaceable. Um, and that has become sort of a driver of this constant connectedness. 
Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, if, if we are saying that even within the military, within the armed forces, uh, it is possible to not need to be connected all the time, that's actually a message that, that needs to be heard beyond the, the armed forces, um, because societally, there has to be a shift away from that notion that uh, everybody is beyond critical to the point that they can't take a break, they need to be, you know, in the office or connected, you know, 20, 24 seven. And so um, I just hearing you say that I think it, it is really important for, for a broader audience uh, beyond this context. Yeah, well, and it's, I mean, there's a, a whole body of social science research and on wellness on how how this affects people. And of course, you would, could you may have seen, I mean, the documentary, I think it was Social Network, came out maybe a year ago or so on Netflix about how you know these Silic these Silicon Valley companies pay very well psychologists by the bucket load to figure out how to get them connected all the time and addicted. That's what they want. Um, so the, the business end of it is connectedness is money. And um, and so of course Facebook is facing a reckoning on this now um, on a number of fronts. And you know maybe there'll be some effort uh, to change this. Um, you know, we've done safety with cars, we've done safety with aircraft, you know, they, there's, there's, there's a whole history of the United States government and other governments saying, okay, we've got to start doing government like things to make this, this practice safer. And I feel like this is coming. Um, and I don't know how it's going to shake out and, and ultimately, but um, it, it just seems to be too big of a problem. Totally agree. And uh, I do hope we can make some progress. Um, it really can become, I mean, it, at least particular to the military, it, it almost could become a, a national security issue and something that we should keep an eye on. Um, okay, I appreciate the discussion and uh, Bill, I appreciate your time tonight. I would like to transition now to our next speaker, um, Ryan Martinson. Uh, he's a researcher in the China Maritime Studies Institute at the Naval War College, holds a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law at, uh, and Diplomacy at Tufts University, uh, and a bachelor's of science from Union College. Uh, he also has studied at Fudan University, the Beijing Language and Culture University, and the Hopkins Nanjing Center. And uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, another part of China's maritime strategy, the distant water fishing fleet. And now we're going to hear about uh, the maritime militia. Uh, his article is No Ordinary Boats Cracking the Code on Ch China's Spratly Maritime Militias. So over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, can you see my slides? I can. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And it's great to be here tonight to, to talk a little bit about my article from earlier this year. Uh, in that article, I look at China's maritime militia, and specifically, I look at its activities in the Spratly Islands of the South China Sea. Um, and so if we were, let's see if I can go to the next slide here. Oh, there we go. So if we were sitting here, say, 10 years ago, uh, we would not have been able to have this conversation about China's maritime militia. Uh, there was simply, at that point, there was simply no research on the topic. We knew that Chinese fishing vessels uh, operated in disputed maritime space, and they sometimes did uh, unusual things, but we, we just, at that point in time, nobody was really doing any deep research on the topic of the maritime militia. Uh, today, fortunately, thanks to the work of a couple of my colleagues at the War College, uh, Connor Kenny and Andrew Erickson, as well as some other researchers here in the United States and other parts of the world, we, we do have a, a, a really good understanding of the maritime militia. And so my research for this article uh, really um, sort of um, develops from a lot of that earlier work. So when I said the word maritime militia, I think many of our audience members will have heard the term before. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, China, China's armed forces have three sort of elements. One is the People's Liberation Army. Another is the People's Armed Police, and the third is the national militia. So China's maritime militia is the sort of salt water part of the national militia. These are not full-time soldiers. These are uh, uh, folks that have, most of them have day jobs in various industries. And in the case of the maritime militia, they often work in marine-related industries like fishing. 
But because of their affiliation with the militia, they, they are organized into units. They receive uh, training. So the photo in the lower right hand corner shows a militia training exercise, uh, training activities. Um, and the Chinese government, specifically the Chinese military, can mobilize these militia forces to conduct operations in both wartime and peacetime. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about uh, in my presentation today is, is Chinese activities or militia activities in the Spratly waters in peacetime. And if you read uh, the writings of Chinese policymakers, they refer to these activities as being maritime rights protection operations. And what that means is China believes it has certain rights in these waters uh, based on their reading of international law and the militia. Uh, is charged with conducting operations to help China defend and advance these rights. Uh, and this involves a whole range of activities, everything from simple presence in these waters, showing the flag to declare Chinese ownership. Uh, and it can also include more coercive activities, such as denying other foreign mariners use of these waters and defending China's own economic use of these waters. Uh, the militia does not operate in disputed space alone. It's out there in conjunction with other elements of Chinese sea power. The Navy is out there and the Coast Guard as well. And Chinese maritime strategists think about these forces as operating uh, um, in, uh, in three lines. Uh, and so the, the militia operates out there in the front line or on the first line, the Coast Guard is on the second line and the Navy is on the third line. And what this simply means is that they have different sort of, there's a division of labor. Uh, in disputed space and they, they, these different forces do different things, but they cooperate together. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that in the q and if, if you're interested. So China's maritime militia operates in the Spratlys. That's very clear. But other Chinese fishing vessels, vessels that have no affiliation with the maritime militia also operate in these waters. These ordinary vessels are there as well. The question becomes which of these boats are militia vessels and which of them are just ordinary fishing vessels? Uh, that question is not easily answered, but it's a very important one because if you are a coastal state, say the Philippines, or if you're the US Navy operating out there and you encounter a Chinese fishing vessel, you want to know who you are dealing with. Because if you're dealing with an ordinary fishing vessel, your approach to handling that encounter would, would probably differ from if you were dealing with a militia vessel is operating by folks who have military training and have a direct line to the Chinese Navy and Coast Guard. So knowing who you're interacting with is important. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of good ways to figuring out who it is that you're interacting with out there. I'm just gonna run through a couple of the big uh, ways that we, we use. The first is, is to, to try to understand who you're dealing with based on behavior. So there are behavioral indicators. Uh, if you see a Chinese fishing vessel in, in the Spratly Islands, it's doing things that do not make economic sense, uh, then it's very likely that that vessel is affiliated with the maritime militia on a mission. And this slide just shows some, some cases from recent years where we have Chinese fishing vessels doing things that, that certainly doesn't, that these things do not make economic sense. Classic cases, the harassment of the impeccable in 2009, defense of a drilling rig by fishing vessels, another case, escorting Chinese seismic survey vessels as they operate in disputed space, and, and just lingering in an area for, for weeks on end and not doing any apparent fishing uh, would not make economic sense. And so we see events like this, we see the hull numbers of the boats, we can get a sense that these vessels are very likely to be maritime militia. Uh, the weakness or the sort of the problem with this approach to identifying militia vessels is that in many cases, Chinese militia vessels are fishing. They do fish out in the Spratly waters. And so, and yet they're still militia and they still can be mobilized to conduct operations. Um, so there's a limit to this approach. Uh, another approach that we use is to look, to read Chinese sources. So there's quite a bit of Chinese media coverage of the maritime militia, a lot of photos of militia boats, training, uh, conducting world, world, real world operations. And so a lot of these photos, or some of these photos at least, will have uh, pictures of vessels and you can see their hull numbers and you can know that that vessel is affiliated with the maritime militia. Uh, the problem with this approach is, although there is a lot of coverage in the Chinese press, the vast majority of militia vessels are not profiled in Chinese media coverage. And so that we just do not know based on reading of, of Chinese uh, media uh, coverage of the maritime militia. We cannot get our 
arms around the full size of the militia fleet. So there are drawbacks. It's a, it's a great challenge to figure out who out there is affiliated with the maritime militia. Uh, this is a problem that's been on my mind for a little while. And, and I was really inspired by uh, events that occurred earlier this year at Whitson Reef. I think many of you remember that hundreds, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of Chinese fishing vessels showed up at Whitson Reef, which is in the Philippines exclusive economic zone. They were lingering in these waters. And the question is, you know, became what are they doing out there? Why are they there now? Uh, the Philippines government was, was publicizing lots of photos of these fishing vessels. Uh, and this sort of development was in the news almost on a regular basis. And one of the things that I saw as I was seeing these photos is a lot of these boats were enormous. They were very different from the fishing vessels that we would see in the past operating in Spratleys. Many of them were wo wooden hulled vessels, smaller displacement craft, here we have these huge uh, steel hulled vessels that are, that are operating in these waters. And it, it got me wondering what had happened. Uh, how was it that suddenly we're seeing all these really large vessels operating in disputed space? And so I started doing some research on the topic, trying to figure out what was going on. And, it's, and it turns out that China has been uh, conducting a massive expansion of its uh, Spratly fishing fleet. This expansion took place, or really be, can trace its roots back to 2012. A number of Chinese academics published a, a paper, uh, actually uh, a proposal that was submitted to the, to the Chinese government in which they argued that the Chinese government should, should elevate the fishing fleet or Chinese marine fishing fleet into a strategic industry. And one of the things that they recommend, recommended was that China scrap a lot of its older vessels and build new boats, larger boats, and they, they highlighted the need for China to develop several what they called backbone fleets that were well-equipped and highly mobile and have them operate in the South China Sea. So this is September 2012. These scholars had a lot of influence in the Chinese government because within months, China started issuing a number of policy documents to do, do just that, to spend lots of money, to, to invest lots of money, in the development or the, the uh, upgrading of China's fishing fleet with a focus on vessels operating in the Spratly Islands. And these vessels were referred to as China's Spratly Backbone Fishing Fleet. This is uh, a development that occurred from about 2013 to 2019. And China uh, provided Chinese fishing companies and fishing boat owners with huge sums of money to scrap their older vessels and build these newer vessels and integrate them, to organize them into what became known as the Spratly Backbone Fishing Fleet. These are very large vessels, most over 400 tons, many over 600 tons, which is huge. Um, as I said, several hundred have already been built. And, and as I was reading these policy documents and sort of trying to understand what was going on, uh, it made, logically, it made sense that if China was building all these vessels and having them operate in disputed space, that they would want to have some control over these vessels. They would want to have people operating the, them who are well-trained, knew what they were doing. Uh, and at that time, when, they, when China was doing this, China had already had developed a maritime militia. And it made sense that China would want to give these vessels two existing militia units that were heading to the Spratlys. And, that, and based on my research, that is what China did. A good portion of these new ships these new boats were given to existing maritime militia units. Uh, the rest were given to ordinary fishing boat companies, fishing companies that, that uh, were willing to commit to operating the Spratlys and being organized into maritime militia units. Um, and so this happened over that time period. And this is just an example of one of these companies. This is called Fancheng Fisheries Company. Uh, in 2017, it signed a contract to build nine backbone Spratly boats. This is a picture on the right. You can see what one of these boats looked like. It's a very large craft. Uh, nine were built. Uh, and these vessels since 2017 have been operating in the Spratlys since then, not doing a lot of fishing, have been involved in a number of, uh, in the, been operating in very sensitive areas. And based on their behavior, uh, you can presume that they are affiliated with the maritime militia. I uh, did a little research into the company and the boats that they own, these backbone boats. And it turns out um, when the vessels were delivered in 2017, uh, at the delivery ceremony, there were members of the Chinese military, the type of folks that you expect to see 
for votes that were delivered to a militia unit. And so this is just one example of, of, of what has been a very large effort to get these big boats in the hands of China's maritime militia uh, and, ha and have them operate in the most sensitive waters of the South China Sea. What are the implications of this? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the Chinese government does not indicate which boats belong to the maritime militia. They just don't tell us, very rarely tell us. But they do provide quite a bit of information about which boats belong to this backbone fleet. And so sort of being able to make the connection between the two opens up all kinds of new opportunities to, to really understand which vessels operating the Spratleys belong to the maritime militia. There's a lot of information out there on this topic. And so uh, coastal states and other countries that are operating out there uh, can use this tool to, to get a better sense of, of the kinds of ships that they are likely to encounter, the kind of ships that are operating in the Spratly Islands. So I'm going to stop right there, um, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about uh, this, this article or, or the topic of China's militia in the Spratly waters. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great presentation, great article. Uh, I'm fascinated by the topic. Uh, I only recently, well, I guess fairly recently, became aware of the maritime militia. Um, er, earlier in my career, there was a, a, a misconception, I guess, that uh, every uh, small boat, every Chinese vessel, uh, you know, is working for the PRC in some way. Um, and it is the, the, the cabbage patch strategy and, and uh, there was never any talk of a maritime militia, but now we, uh, through research like yours, we understand that there's an actual organization, that there's participate, there's membership, there's training. Uh, but I guess my, my question really is, was it really a misconception or is there a gray area? And I think you kind of alluded to it in terms of the backbone fleet, whether you're actually a participant in the or a member of the maritime militia or not, I'm curious to know uh, for those that are not, so they haven't received the training and they're not specifically members of the maritime militia, uh, are, are there, is there still a line of communication to the, uh, the PRC or I guess the, 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 the CCP? I'm not really sure, but I'm just curious how much, uh, you know, you could say, how much are they working for the government of China? Uh, sure. Apart from their 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 legitimate activities at sea, sure, that's a great question. One that I get asked a lot. Um, like I said, there are really two classes of Chinese vessels operating in the Spratlys. One is the militia vessels, which may be fishing, uh, but they can be mobilized to do uh, missions for the, the the military and for the Coast Guard. Uh, and other there are also other vessels out there that we might describe as ordinary vessels. These are these are boats that are owned by folks and, and, and operated by folks that have no affiliation, no direct affiliation with the militia. And yet they're still out there. And um, in China, the Chinese government very much wants them to be out there. And not, not just because of the fact that they're out there catching fish and contributing to the local economy. Uh, that's part of it. Although, that, you know, if you're the Chinese government sitting in Beijing, the little bit of fish that they catch and the small amount of income they make is not really a big consideration. Really, I would argue that the Chinese government wants them to be out there because of their ability to manifest China's ownership over these waters. And this is, these are actually terms that they use. By having a fishing vessel, whether militia or not, operating, say, uh, in the southern part of the, of the Nine Dash Line and in, in Indonesia's EEZ, these vessels just being there showing the flag are demonstrating or declaring uh, Chinese uh, China's claims to these waters. So that is politically valuable to the Chinese government. And so uh, being out there is dangerous for these ordinary uh, fishing vessels. There have been a number of incidents, especially prior to say 2016. Uh, there are a number of incidents where these coastal states will send out Coast Guard or even naval vessels to harass them, board their boats, even fire upon them. Um, it's, it's dangerous work, and it was dangerous work for a number of years, and there were a lot of uh, reasons why they would not want to go out there um, because of the dangers. The Chinese government saw that there was a decline in Chinese fishing activities in these waters, uh, activities of ordinary boats, and so they took a number of steps to try to encourage them to get back out there. Uh, one of the things that they did was to start escorting them as they operate in disputed space. So we see, I talked about the three lines. 
uh, militia, fishing vessels out there on the first line. The Coast Guard's near them as well and is available to come to their aid. Um, they can use these, these Beidou satellite communication systems to contact the Coast Guard to let them know if they're facing any danger and the Coast Guard will come there and, and protect them from, um, from foreign um, Coast Guards that may want to board them or, or otherwise harass them. So that they've been protect, better protected in recent years. They, they installed these vessels with these Beidou systems, which I just mentioned, that gives them a direct line to Chinese authorities. So even when they're out there and they're not, these vessels that are not part of the militia, they do have the ability to communicate things they see. Uh, and so we can pretty, feel pretty certain, even if a vessel is not belongs to the maritime militia, if, they, if a fishing vessel encounters, say, a US Navy special mission ship, operating within the nine dash line, they can easily communicate back to um, the Coast Guard uh, and um, other parts of the Chinese government to let them know. So there's direct communications with them. Uh, I don't know how secure they are. Um, and the other thing they did is they provide, have provided huge subsidies to the vessel owners to, to fuel subsidies and other types of subsidies to get them to, to go out there and operate in space. And uh, the, all of these efforts have really paid off because in recent years, um, Chinese fishing vessels operating uh, in these disputed areas have, have been really, um, have been far safer. has been far more secure than everywhere in the past. And this is, this is the direct result of policies by the Chinese government. So hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. And you can, mm -hmm. you can really see based on your comments, you can really see a clear connection between the uh, maritime militia uh, or other fishing vessels in the South China Sea, and then the uh, the comments from uh, Ian earlier about the distant water fishing fleet and the the legitimacy that uh, uh, is brought about by presence that China believes in, and I, I think we probably share the same view uh, in terms of U.S. government and other. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting to see the parallels. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Thank you again uh, for your time and for your article and your comments. Uh, uh, this is a sure. great presentation and I appreciate the, um, the visual as well. Um, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry, did, uh, Cornell, did you have something? Oh, no, I was just going to, if there was time to throw another question, uh, Ryan's where I was going to, uh, I had one for him, but if uh, we need to keep moving on, I see we are a little bit behind schedule. Uh, we can proceed. Yeah, well, I don't want to uh, cut you off. Um, so if it, uh, go ahead and ask the question and um, we'll just uh, keep pressing along. Sure, yeah. So Ryan, just kind of curious, obviously your your article um, focuses predominantly on the Spratly Backbone fleet. Um, what do you think the prospects are for um, sort of similar dedicated fleets in other contested areas? You know, you start the article off with, uh, you know, reference to the Senkakus, um, but then it really narrows down on the, on the Spratleys. Do you think there's a possibility that these votes are, um, you know, pivoted towards uh, disputes with, with China, uh, with, with Japan and uh, South Korea? Or um, should we expect a, a, a new fleet um, to, to show up for the, the Senkaku backbone fleet? Yes, thanks. It's a, it's a great question. I, I don't expect and I have not seen any evidence to suggest that China would seek to establish similar fleets in the East China Sea or in the Yellow Sea. Um, fisheries concerns or fisheries disputes are just not the same issue that they are in the South China Sea. So we, you know, sometimes we do see Chinese fishing vessels operating in the vicinity of Senkaku Islands, for example, um, under escort. Um, but uh, just to very briefly answer your question, because I know we're very behind, I have not seen any indications that they're looking to set up similar types of professionalized fleets of fishing vessels for these waters, just because fisheries disputes are not the same sort of issue that are in the South China Sea. Hope that, hope that answers your question. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Uh, great question, Cornell. Uh, okay, I'm going to shift over to Frank Gortner. Um, Frank is, a, is actually a former uh, SIMSEC officer, uh, as well as a retired uh, US Navy commander. And he's the director for military veteran affairs and national security programs at the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business. His final uniform contribution to the Navy was as lead author of a 2017 report on future fleet design 
and architecture for 2045. And the title of his article, the Navy should stop talking about the future and start building it. So with that, over to you, Frank. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. And uh, I, can everyone see my screen share here with some slides? Okay, I'm going to assume Thank yes. You. So uh, um, at, when Jimmy first sort of contacted me about this uh, this presentation, I actually had to kind of take a step back and um, and remember that it was less than a year ago that this article came out and that you know i say that because it so much has transpired it feels like during that year and yet um in some senses so little has also been done around some of the stuff that i talked about in the article so i thought um here to kind of go back and talk a little bit about um you know the before so the context from which the article is written um, and then what has happened since, and then some of the things that we can do next or that I'm thinking of next, and that maybe we can also think about as we think about um, maritime strategy going forward. So a little bit um, of context, you know, what was going on before? Well, I, I as Jimmy mentioned, I'm a retired Navy. I spent more time in the Pentagon than generally I like to admit. Um, but there were five big things that I would say I learned about strategy in the various tours that I did in the Pentagon. Um, the first is that, you know, naval strategists or newly minted military strategists come into the Pentagon and they talk a lot about what they, you know, about whole of government strategy. Um, but what I found, you know, working uh, strategy and policy across, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, um, Russia, Ukraine, is that when, when, when we envision a whole of government, what we tend, tend to more often get is the black hole of government. Um, we like to think that, the, that other branches beyond uh, or and other departments beyond the military and agencies beyond the military can, you know, um, can actually execute strategy. But the reality is, is that our foreign policy is so heavily militarized at this point um, that really beyond treasury, um, there is almost no other agency that can do timely and sustained uh, global impact on a strategic level. Um, the second is that once they, uh, so once they kind of, once strategists start to realize that whole of government um, ideas really are not executable, they tend to look to the next best thing, which is leadership. Um, and the problem with that, and for the Navy, that means the CNO or, or SECNAV. Um, the problem with that is that uh, neither the CNO nor SECNAV are really strategists. And so, you know, they are more influencers. Uh, they have about two years at best to achieve influencing momentum uh, and start to at least put some things in action uh, before they're kind of seen as lame ducks and working out and, you know, and people start to work around them uh, for the next um, you know, for other ambitions. And, uh, you know, if they were in the last administration, that was actually only about six months in many cases. So once they, people realize that, they start to think, well, okay, let me look at written strategy. Um, well, the problem is, you know, as Peter Drucker kind of famously said, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, if that's the case, then in OpNav, you know, the staff there eat strategy for mid rats before you even get to breakfast. And that's because the staff is not designed to be strategic or to execute strategy long term. It's designed really to uh, sustain current operations and structure. That's it's a big bureaucracy. So that's what it's designed to do. Um, the fourth really comes from my experience working the Russia desk back you know, in one of my first tours there. And I remember going to uh, an INCSI naval staff talks uh, with or uh, with um, the Russians and we you know Navier got up and they gave this grand strategic brief about um, our Black Sea strategy and after the brief they looked at we looked to the Russians and the Russian admiral that was uh, chairing their their delegation just kind of stone-faced and he looked over to uh, you know the the English speaker among them who was probably GRU and he said, okay, and he kind of nodded to him. And the GRU officer kind of smirked 
And he said, well, you know, you Americans always come with pretty slides and lots of words about what you think and what you want. We let you talk, but what we really care about is just watching what you do. Um, and so, and that, you know, kind of left the air, took the air out of the room, obviously, among, um, you know, the American staff officers who had slaved over these slides and tried to convince the Russians to, to join us in sort of our strategic approach. But that really is the reality, right? I mean, what we, our strategy is what we do. It's not what we say we will do. And finally, you know, in that last tour, you know, doing future fleet um, design, um, we came to really appreciate that we cannot really prognosticate the future. The only way to get ahead of it is to go ahead and get on and invent it, right, with future fleet design, uh, different from the current fleet that we have. Um, with that, you know, fast forward to about a year or um, actually about three, a uh, few years after I retired. So we published the report, the Future Fleet Design and Architecture Report that Jimmy referenced in uh, 2000, uh, early 2018. Um, a lot of fanfare uh, around it. Um, it. It briefed it to the Hill, briefed it to um, many, many different areas of, the, of DOD uh, across the different services as well as throughout the Navy. Um, and then, the office that I was in was stood down uh, and the it kind of languished. Um, I retired, moved on, started working uh, you know at my my current job. And then in October of 2020, um, they referenced the document um, in sort of the grand fanfare that was um, Secretary of Defense Espers future naval force study and battle force 2045. And when I looked at, and I had kept up with folks in the office and I looked at everything that had been done, it, I realized that those three years were just spent talking in the Pentagon and really very little of what we, even though they had effectively endorsed now what we were doing, very little of it was actually uh, actualized. And so that led me to go ahead and put pen to paper um, in a couple, over a couple of days and write this article. And the main points in it uh, were kind of evidencing the fact that we had already written the words, you know, three years ago. Uh, but honestly, words are cheap in the Pentagon. Um, we had devised what we thought was a strategy, um, but strategy is fragile, especially when you have such high rapid turnover um, in in senior positions. And ultimately, you know, my conclusion was that building is everything. And that building needs to, um, to to be focused on first, you know, a future fleet or a staff structure, uh, building a staff structure in the Navy staff that is um, that prioritizes future fleet requirements over um, current uh, fleet uh, demands. That um, you know establishes learning momentum across the organization. That uh, addresses our very very serious challenges with maritime manufacturing on which any strategy is going to be uh, dependent. Um, looks at the reality that, you know, these new technologies that are being developed, especially in the, you know, sort of the digital architectures and networking, um, we really need to think through and engage how we're going to sustain ally interoperability if we have any intention of sustaining the alliances that we've relied on. And finally, the cost, the sheer cost of building a future fleet demands that we get outside of our bubble and start talking a lot more um, seriously with the uh, taxpayers who are going to have to put the bill and in many cases trade political offsets in order to, to build the future fleet. Um, so obviously a year has happened. What's happened? Uh, you know, there actually, you know, what has happened, I'll take you through sort of my, um, my list of the goods, the not the questionable and then the not greats, right? Uh, on a positive front, I you know the Marine Corps I think is doing great with their future with their future force design 2030. Um, they are out experimenting with it, learning a lot of lessons, being very transparent about what they're learning. Um, I think the Navy is doing that with distributed maritime operations, um, with Project Overmatch and some of the naval operational architecture. Uh, I, I have a lot of um, 
uh, hope in the USB systems vision and task force. I wish that there were a lot more operational concepts behind them, but I think that they're coming, uh, you know, they're certainly expanding, um, the, you know, their, their production of, of USB systems and experimenting with, with how they, uh, how they could, or starting to conceptualize how they'll kind of build, build them into force packages. I think the expansion of Naval X and finally sort of the sustainment and momentum behind N7 are all really, you know, positive developments. You know, what am I more circumspect about? Um, Tri-service maritime strategy. Uh, it's a bizarre document. It's not really a strategy. It's more kind of a mission statement of the Navy and it's out there. It's referenced in the last budget, but it's really, as I said, not, not particularly helpful if you're looking to figure out um, if you're looking to chart a competitive uh, course against uh, adversaries. Um, it, the future Naval Force Study Battle Force 2045 that I referenced, again, it hasn't been sort of discounted, but it was dropped right before an election, which is bizarre. Um, and, uh, and then it really, nobody has kind of um, counteracted it or, or superseded it with another uh, document at this point. Um, you could say that CNO's NAV plan is the attempt to do that, but um, that kind of gets to part of the strategic ambiguity that happens and the fact that words are cheap. Um, every CNO comes in, they've got a new way that they like to talk about their strategic vision, whether it's a force design or whether it's a NAV plan. Um, what that, I, I'm not really sure what any of them are. I, I wish that we would just get a little bit more strategic, a little bit more coherence around um, uh, how directive any of these documents really are. Um, digital transformation and integration is, uh, is, is meandering, it seems, uh, within, within the Pentagon. And then finally, the UK subs, there's, or the Australia, UK, US subs agreement, a lot of promise, but I think a lot of question marks around whether they're, we're actually going to be able to actualize it through well, the maritime base. And then last, you know, what are we really struggling with? Well, I think OpNav is not, I don't see really any significant movement in, you know, unfreezing Middle Earth of OpNav uh, to, be able to, be, to in particular start to reorganize high nine end codes uh, around future fleet requirements. Um, surface warfare culture reform, I think is still really struggling and needs to be addressed. Uh, the maritime civil industry and infrastructure investment, we have not talked about that seriously as a nation and the Navy needs to start to really um, I think that figure out how to ensure that it's not only uniformed officers going to Congress and requesting money for the Navy. I, I, will, I will believe that we are on the right track when the first civilian corporate executive goes to the Hill and testifies that we need a bigger Navy. Um, and finally, you know, I think that we, there's still a lot of room to contemplate new naval missions. I think that we assume, we continue to assume in most of our strategy, if you will, that, um, that tomorrow's naval missions will be the same as today's. We just have to win them differently. And I think that's a dangerous assumption to make as, um, you know, uh, competition and uh, potentially warfare uh, shifts considerably with modern adversaries. Um, I'll, I'll stop there uh, in the interest of time, and I'd love to hear any any sort of comments or, or thoughts that anyone may have. Great, thank you, Frank. Um, we have uh, we have time for questions, so. Um, I've been leading off, but uh, I'll, I'll defer here. It looks like Bill has a question. Frank, thanks. That was, it's a great article. It's just a vexing topic. Um, as you know, what we're doing with the American Sea Power Project, probably following along and, and others. So I will tell you there's an upcoming author, I'm not going to mention his name, um, who served at very high levels of government, both in the Navy and DOD, who's I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it's, the gist of it is a maritime strategy is like looking for the end of the rainbow. It doesn't exist after gold, water, nickel. It's a waste right. of time, essentially. 
Um, I know who it is, and I know what his argument is. So, <laughs> and I, I agree largely with it. Um, not 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 a hundred percent, but I largely agree with it. About sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, I you know, I was just going to ask what your view is on that. We seem to be beating ourselves up mercilessly about not having a strategy, and I start to come to a conclusion that maybe there isn't a strategy to be had here. Uh, maybe there's another way. I mean. Congressman Luria, God bless her, you know, she's sort of asking for that, right, in her in her writing and, and what she's talked about publicly. She calls it sometimes a concept of operations, but I think when I listen to her or read her, she's really talking about a strategy. Um, and uh, I don't know, I don't know if there is one. I don't know. Um, there's a lot, so many very talented and smart people have, have led our Navy for the last 25 years, I, I start to think, well, maybe that this doesn't it really, this isn't really a thing. Well, I, you know, it's interesting. That's great. Thanks for the question. I'll actually, I'll, I'll take you through the the last slides that I had because it, it, it this speaks exactly, they, they speak to this. Um, I, I wasn't going to go through them in the interest of time, but since you prompted it. Um, you know, what do I think we need next? And this gets to some of what, the, you know, the, the person you were talking about. You know, when we talk about, when we hear the phrase, we need a new maritime strategy, people banter that about. But what I want us to do, what I would like us to do is take a step back and dissect that and define what we are really talking about. First off, strategy, okay? Are you saying that we need more words put to paper, you know, that tie, tie, the Navy's mission set to the defense strategy and the national security strategy, which is going to change, you know, uh, you know, with the next SECNAV and the next defense secretary, et cetera, et cetera, and the next administration. I don't think we need more words. I think we need action. And that comes through the budget. And we need more, you know, we need more internal mechanisms to account for, you know, the budget, you know, one budget to the next um, progress over programs. Um, then there's the word maritime. I mean, we talk about maritime strategy, but oftentimes people are talking about, and this is where I don't 100% agree with, I think, your forthcoming author. Um, a lot of times people will talk about maritime, or, or my classmate, you know, Elaine Luria. I agree with her largely, but large, what she's asking for is a naval strategy, not a maritime strategy. Okay. I think what your author is asking for is a, defense, is a maritime defense strategy. What I think both of those oftentimes miss is the fact that without having a strategy that speaks to also our civil maritime capacity and our industrial capacity to sustain both, you know, logistics as well as then the, the, the defense, the fleet defense needs, it's, it, it's useless, right, to talk about a naval strategy. Um, then, you know, there's the, we need a new naval str maritime strategy. How new are you really talking, right? A lot of people kind of are, want to retread, you know, 1980s strategies or previous strategy, previous era strategies, as opposed to actually really thinking through what the strategic approach needs to be versus, you know, what does victory look like against modern adversaries, right? We honestly, we've never, we, we, there's a lot of assumptions that we're kind of evolving into another Cold War, but this is unprecedented territory. We've never been in a multipolar nuclearized world, right? So what does victory look like in that world? I'm pretty sure it doesn't look like any of the op plans that we have currently on the shelf, right? Um, and then finally, when you say we, who are you talking about in terms of we need a new maritime strategy, right? Is it people like us who are navalists kind of thinking through this, or is it inclusive of the taxpayers that are actually gonna to have to pay for it and are gonna to have to make very real offsets um, to enable it? And just an example, as an example for those offsets, I mean, you know, we spend $11 billion a year in GI Bill funding, right? That's the equivalent of two Virginia class submarines you know, that we could produce every year, right? It's also the equivalent of a 40% increase in Pell Grants, which is in the current budget, right? So, I mean, those are simple offset, you know, but, you know, at some point, those are the political decisions that are gonna need to be made by the American people to decide whether or not we actually 
build anything more than the current fleet that we have to the ambitions that people have. Um, and, and finally, I just, this was kind of my closing thought. You know, I think a lot of it is that, you know, we can go back to sort of, you know, Amazon has this sort of famous saying about, you know, stay at day one, right? Um, once you get past day two as a startup, then you lose the hustle, you lose the ability to kind of innovate. And I think that, you know, we built the Navy without a vision, you know, um, you know, yesterday, 243 years ago, we, the, 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 the birthday of the Navy was just build two ships and we'll figure out what to do. We'll figure out how to use them, you know? Um, and in a sense, I think that's what we kind of have to do with the future fleet. We've got to get past sort of opining for this grand vision that is written and will somehow sustain itself through 14 administrations to come, you know, as we build it. And instead, just recognize that we just have to build it and then we'll figure it out as we go. And I know that sounds simple, but honestly, I think that's the approach that we kind of have to have to be more comfortable taking. No, uh, thank you. I mean, I like that answer. I mean, you think historically, how many times has the Navy had a maritime ship? I mean, the you have the famous '86, you know, the one that people think about, you know, nostalgically, like this was the greatest thing ever. And maybe War Plan Orange, you know, was sort of the operating strategy of the '30s that led us to victory in the Pacific ultimately. I mean, it's really not, it's an anomaly. It, it's not something that the Navy has generally had. No, I agree. And and I think, you know, I, I tell you where my bias comes from is that, um, you know, my grandfather during World War II was the general counsel for the Maritime War Commission Board um, and the Maritime Commission before that. And it, uh, you know, the maritime strategy of World War II largely evolved out of our, our national decision to build a civil maritime capacity, right? And then that, that, that precipitated the need for a Navy to defend it, right? And I think people kind of forget that. Now we're on the flip side. Like we've got this amazing Navy, but we have virtually no civil maritime capacity, which begs the question, like, what the hell do we need this Navy for, <laughs> right? We kind of build justifications for this Navy that we want to sustain as opposed to actually, you know, um, you know, defining the Navy according to what the nation needs it to do. Okay, thanks. Wonderful to, to hear that, that back and forth between Bill and Frank. Um, I've got a question from the audience uh, from Michael Hart. He asks, uh, or his question goes, Admiral Mullen articulated the thousand ship Navy concept. Could a force structure of smaller, more numerous frigates be a way to increase fleet size and presence, and more importantly, encourage partners to procure similar vessels that will be interoperable? Quantity has a quality all of its own. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, I agree 100%. Mike, you know, I, I was, I think Mike and I actually were in the Pentagon together when they did the thousand, when, you know, the thousand ship Navy came about. And, um, I actually think that, that that wasn't a strategy, it was a vision, but I actually think it was one of the more effective visions that we've had a CNO establish because it created, um, it, it expanded the we when as soon, before we ever started talking about that we need a new maritime strategy, right? And so it made the, that we very inclusive so that, you know, as we started to talk about a strategy, we were thinking, it, it forced us to think about um, how we built it with allies, how we built it with cost in mind, um, where, and how we built it, you know, with, um, you know, you know, trying to inspire also sort of political buy-in um, on the Hill for it. Um, you know, it probably landed at the wrong time because it was such a, you know, because we were a peacetime world, uh, you know, and so there wasn't the need sort of to invest huge amounts in the Navy when we were no longer really a civil maritime, but, you know, the civil maritime industry was no longer sort of a strategic priority for the nation. Um, but I think that there's really, what I, what I think is that we're, we're at a time right now 
where it would be very timely to revisit that, right? The idea of a thousand ship Navy, the idea of global maritime partnerships. And I think that there's actually, you know, current events um, are favorable to us moving in that direction um, if we start to have the right, use the right narratives and start the right discourses. Um, just, you know, my thought is that in, one of the things the Navy has to kind of get off of is trying to convince the American public that they should get excited about war with China. Okay, because I can tell you, sitting in a business school in which half of our students are Chinese, you are not going to win that argument with the American public, right, uh, and the taxpayers. Now, what you could win with them is the fact that a even just a two-month blip in the supply chain, right, because of the pandemic, has driven up inflation almost 2% in two months. And so now, instead of facing the three, you know, the three percent projections that we had for inflation over the next three years, we're we're confronting five percent inflation. And by the way, if we go back and look at 1942, we faced 10 percent inflation, almost 11 percent, and 1917 was 17 percent inflation. So the last time we had global conflicts, you were talking about double-digit inflation numbers. So now let's talk, let's have a serious conversation about the cost of conflict, right? And the, and sort of the stability stimulus, if you will, or the stimulus of stability and what the Navy's role is in trying to sustain that, right? And I think that that could be a much more palatable argument to the American people and it, for them to start to think through, okay, so maybe I would be willing, right, in order to avoid, you know, 10% inflation and basically the eradication of almost all of the um, infrastructure uh, investments that we're envisioning right now, maybe I would be willing to actually stomach, you know, a cutback to Pell Grants or, you know, take your pick of social programs to build and sustain a Navy. Frank, thank you for that. That was a, a great, great answer to a, a great question. Um, well, we have a few more minutes while we wait for um, Steve Wills to join. Uh, he's going to wrap up with a discussion of his new book. Um, so I would like to uh, be a little selfish and ask a question of my own. Uh, Frank, the, the Thousand Ship Navy uh, comment was interesting because I'm uh, in the middle of uh, I'm doing some research on a project myself. And I came across the report uh, on the thousand, uh, and one of the, uh, and also uh, real quick, the, the as good as that report was, uh, and the vision itself, um, chi China is is barely mentioned in it, um, and that's just the nature of the the world that uh, uh, that existed when it was written. Um, of course, now the the specter of China and the and great power competition it's an entirely uh it's a it's a different world but the the concept of global maritime partnerships as you pointed out are uh, even more important arguably um but one of the things that the report said that, is that there was uh, there was no unifying agency or organization within the federal government that could represent all of these requirements, uh, these uh, interests uh, to the president or to our international partners. And, you know, as I, as I look at the bureaucracy uh, uh, and all of our maritime interests and the various organizations, the Navy is just one of many that have uh, a role to play in maritime interests for the uh, American uh, people and the American government. You know, there's at least four different maritime strategies. Uh, there's, of course, there's the tri-service maritime strategy. There's the strategy for maritime security. There's the Department of Transportation's maritime strategy. Uh, there's even a NOAA maritime strategy uh, for mapping the, the EEZ. Uh, and then, of course, there's other plans and policies. Uh, but it, it occurred to me, and so the, to get down to the question is, are we, are we even configured uh, are we structured in the right way to even develop a strategy or 
should we look to restructure uh, or, or you know is that possible uh, maybe before maybe there is a strategy out there uh, we just can't see it because we're not structured in the right way to uh, develop it or to see it as opposed to China for example uh, which is <laughs> executing a whole of nation strategy uh, a maritime strategy uh, seemingly quite well uh, over to you Frank uh, that's, a, that's a great point and question, Jimmy. I, I think I, I agree. Uh, that's why I kind of say that, you know, we when we talk about whole of government, right, more often than not, all the plans that we make for whole of government fall into the whole of government, right? Um, uh, the, uh, you know, my, I'm a big, I'm a strong advocate that we need a new maritime commission akin to the one that was stood up in 19. 36, right? When America um, decided that it wanted to be a maritime, global maritime power for really the first time in its history, and it wanted both a civil, right, and a um, naval maritime industry to, to support it. Um, and so, you know, the president and Congress established a bipartisan, you know, um, maritime commission, and they drove it um, you know, in part, right, as a, uh, as a political um, uh, commission, but it was also empowered. It was not like the 9-11 commission. It was empowered to actually execute, um, you know, a budget to stimulate, you know, our civil maritime industry. Um, so it was kind of a, a commission on steroids. Now, could we ever do that today? I don't, you know, it's hard to envision it in today's environment, right? Political environment. Um, but I think that, you know, what we, but, but I think that's what we need first. Um, I think that we are in this weird situation where the tail is trying to wag the dog and the dog just doesn't want to be wagged. And what I mean that is that, you know, we keep sending uniform naval officers to the hill to try to convince the American people that we need a maritime strategy. And that will never fly because they look exactly like they are, which is lobbyists, right? For their own interests and their own budgetary piece of the pot. Um, and so that's why I think that we need a commission, but that commission also needs to be able to engage non what, what we would not traditionally consider to be the US maritime industry but nonetheless, commercial interests in America that have an interest in maritime security. So, you know, what does that look like? Well, again, I will think, I will believe that we're on the right track when, you know, Jeff Bezos, right, goes to the Hill and says, I need the US Navy to do X, right? I mean, I'm building autonomous ships, right? Or, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the CEO of Google goes to the Hill to say, I've got undersea servers. I need the U.S. Navy to stop this harassing activity that's coming from adversaries. You need to invest in the U.S. Navy, right? When that happens, so non-military, non-naval officers, non-shipbuilding CEOs go to Congress and start to lobby for a larger Navy, then I will believe we're on the right course. All right. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate that. Uh, and that's a, a great final point to make um, on a, a great discussion and a great article. Uh, we do have Steve Wills uh, with us. He's joined us uh, from CNA. Uh, he's been instrumental in um, us even having this event. So we're very appreciative, Steve, uh, this year and in years past. Um, We'd like to, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Steve, so that you can take the last uh, 10 minutes or, or so of our event, uh, of our evening, and discuss your new book, a Strategy Shelved, uh, The Collapse of Cold War Naval Strategic Planning, which you can find at the Naval Institute Press. Over to you, Steve. Jimmy, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so very much. I'm sorry I'm late. Tonight is my Naval War College uh, course. I teach JMO. Uh, I think some of you out in the audience have, have taught or, or, or currently teach as well. Uh, so uh, you appreciate the challenges in, in trying to work through that. 
and hopefully my Zoom link will uh, remain steady here. Um, what's the key point behind Strategy Shelf? Uh, there's a review of the maritime strategy of the 1980s and how we got there, but the key focus is the years 1989 to 1994 as being a key inflection point Uh, in terms of U.S. strategy and policy, and why is that? You into uh, our present intents and purposes. Uh, the first of those fully. Uh, embraces his powers uh, that were provided and expanded in the Goldwater Nichols Act of 19 with less control over the force uh, for both the chief of naval operations and for the secretary of the Navy in some cases. Uh, you have the end of the Cold War, the whole of the maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy uh, is based upon the presumption of a potential war with the Soviet Union. That's how it was away uh, at short notice. That's a big change. And then there's finally Gulf War I. Uh, a lot of people don't think about the first Gulf War as being a big strategic changer, uh, but it is in the fact that the Army and the Air Force get to demonstrate what they've been doing throughout the Cold War period in terms of operational art and uh, an operational concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, the Army gets to demonstrate air land battle. Uh, the Air Force gets to demonstrate some of the air warfare planning that it had, had intended to conduct on the central front uh, in Germany against the Soviet Union. Uh, the US, you know, Iraq doesn't have a submarine force. Iraq doesn't have a big surface Navy. Uh, the U.S. Navy flies airstrikes uh, as part of the, uh, the overall Joint Force Air Component Command, but that's led by the Air Force. Uh, U.S. Navy forces conduct blockades. Uh, conduct vital operations in the Persian Gulf. They get ready to prepare for an amphibious attack that never comes. Uh, but the Marines find other employment ashore and are quite successful at it. Uh, but the Navy doesn't get to really demonstrate what it planned to do uh, the way the other services did. Um, <clears throat> so it tends to enter the, <clears throat> excuse me, the 1990s in a period of not so much confusion, but some strategic disarray. And I think um, the statements of Admiral Kelso, uh, Frank Kelso, as CNO during his confirmation hearings in June uh, 1990, sum up kind of what I'm talking about. And they sort of lend a title to the book as well. So when asked by then very junior Senator John McCain as to what would happen to the maritime strategy and all the effort the Navy had put into it, uh, Admiral Kelso, and to paraphrase him, he said to the effect, in order to have a strategy, we need an enemy, and we don't have an enemy anymore. So now we need a policy. And he furthermore said that the maritime strategy could be put you know, on a shelf and taken down again uh, if needed. So hence the, the title of the book, Strategy Shelf. And now as we attempt to sort of take down naval strategy, and I caught the tail end of your conversation about the challenges involved in coming up with a new naval or maritime strategy uh, to deal with new strategic competitors or whatever we're calling them, uh, it's useful to go back and look at how we took apart the last one and what we did that caused problems for us so that today we have more challenges in, in doing a maritime strategy again the same way we did or similar to what we did in the 1980s. And with that, I welcome any last questions you have and thank you for your time. Steve, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us and uh, giving us a uh, an overview of the book. Um, I will uh, open it up to the field for questions. It looks like Frank's got one. Hi, Frank. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I uh, I love the I love this discussion because I actually um, in my very first tour in the Pentagon declassified the the 1980 maritime strategy. I was the Russia desk officer. And, uh, and what I 
found fascinating about it as I read through it, it was the first time I had read it, and I realized, holy smokes, there's no way we could do this today, even <laughs> if we tried, because OpNav is not structured to be able to do it. We had a Russia directorate, and OpNav was, you know, was empowered, you know, obviously, you know, pre Goldwater Nichols, but also not just that, they were organized um, for, they were not organized by regionality. We didn't have the COCOMs kind of carving up the world according to our vision of how it should look. Um, so my question for you is, if we were to, what would we have to reorganize in OpNav in order to even start to think about a maritime, a new maritime strategy akin to that one? Well, there'd be have to be some big changes and you're absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, correct there. Um, the quality of people, some people have said the, the quality of people in OpNav isn't what it was in the maritime strategy period. I don't think that's true. There's just less people. That's the big problem. Uh, when people like uh, Peter Schwartz were there, they had about three or four times as many officers working on those products as what they do now. So numbers matter, certainly. Uh, they had a lot of people who were, were repeat offenders within the office. Um, you know, you'd go and do an operational assignment, come back and do another assignment in OpNav N3 and 5. Uh, back then, Uh, op 603 come back and do repeat by whatever operational needs their detailer comes up with um not so often what the needs of the strategy part are so that's 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 certainly a challenge and yes goldwater nichols has made it very difficult to do that uh excuse me goldwater nichols presumes that the cocoms are going to generate all those strategy documents and the services are merely service you know providers of forces but the fact that the Navy continues to generate strategy products uh, that you saw, no doubt, when you were sitting We may have lost yes. Steve. Oh, there he is. Sorry. I, I, my internet connection may not be great. My apologies. Um, but um, but changing some aspects of Goldwater Nichols to allow for a service strategy, it doesn't have to be operational to the point where the maritime strategy was in terms of arrows going here and allies will do this. And it was very much operational. Uh, at the operational enable that, or at least that because the Navy looks at a battle space that's 70% of the world's surface, that it has to have a service strategy to deal with that. But we will see. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Frank, for the question. Um, I appreciate uh, your, your remarks, and I hope everyone uh, has an opportunity to check out uh, Steve's new book, Strategy Shelves. Uh, you can find it at the U.S. Naval Institute Press. And um, I think we're about out of time. We've uh, we've run the full two hours, and I think we've had a lot of great questions, great presentations on some fantastic articles uh, that have been uh, huge contributors to the success of SimSec over the past year. So I my my heartfelt Thanks uh, to all of you. Um, I will uh, uh, offer up a, a couple of things to keep an eye out uh, for on the horizon for uh, SimSec. In next month in November, uh, we'll be having officer elections uh, for the, the new group to lead uh, SimSec into the future. So if you're interested in becoming more active in that way, uh, just stay tuned on the website or just feel free to shoot me a note. And then in December, uh, dates specifically TBD, but uh, we'll be ha hoping, having our fiction contest, second annual fiction contest with the Naval Institute. Uh, we already have all the submissions. We are uh, going through them now and the judges uh, will be uh, judging them 
partially uh, very soon. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, publishing the winners uh, uh, later on later this on. year. So with that, uh, I will wrap this, uh, this evening up. Uh, again, thank you very much. We are recording. Uh, we have recorded the, uh, the entire event. Uh, so all of the presentations and the questions and answers uh, will be able to be shared with our broader audience uh, membership uh, via the website. We'll just have to do some editing and then we'll, we'll take a little time and then we'll post it and make sure everybody gets uh, the link. So with that, uh, thank you again for a, a great CIFAR. Uh, this has um, been a great event and I look forward to next year. Thank you all. Have an excellent day or night. Thanks. Bye. Out here. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy.